I want to talk about the iPod. iMac, iBook, iPod. Why it became a cultural phenomenon. How it helped save Apple. Just hit the three trillion dollar mark. And give birth to the iPhone. It's a widescreen iPod with touch controls. But also, why it absolutely had to die. After 21 years on the market, Apple saying goodbye to the beloved iPod. I want to focus on three very specific decisions that Apple made. Decisions that led to the iPod's incredible success, but also its inevitable destruction. These are some of the best products we've ever created. They're the best iPods ever. And it all begins, it all starts with the second coming of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs went back to Apple after 11 years. Somebody once called me the iCEO about a year ago, and I like that, so I'm gonna choose that as my title. Because Apple had been weeks away from bankruptcy, literally weeks away, but they'd bought Next, got Steve back as CEO, and he'd worked with Johnny Ive and the team to produce, to launch. This is iMac. Steve was pushing for this whole, the Mac can become the digital hub of our new emerging digital lifestyle. Apple had found good enough cameras and video recorders and everything else that they wanted, everything except for a good music player. Steve just hated the ones already on the market, called them all crap. Either the flash storage meant they couldn't hold enough or the hard drives made them way too chunky, USB was too slow to transfer, or the user experience was just yuck. Steve wanted something better, so he had John Rubenstein, his head of hardware, who'd followed him over from Next. Steve had him go to work on this project to build a better music player, this project codenamed Dulcimer, after the instrument. You know, I started scrounging around for all this stuff and, and trying to put the pieces together. But see, here's the thing. John had found these tiny hard drives in Japan, which solved the storage problem. Apple had Firewire, which solved the transfer speed problem. They'd even just bought SoundJam and were busy reintroducing it as iTunes. So you could rip, mix, and burn your CDs, but that was half the user experience. They were still missing everything else. There wasn't anyone at Apple I wanted to do it because all the really good people I had at Apple, I couldn't pull off of what they were working on. So, and this still blows my mind even today, they contracted it all out, almost. John contracted Tony Fidel to run the project. I was a consultant, and so what I was definitely thinking was, I need to take this consultancy role because I need the money. He'd been working on portable electronics and music players for years already, and he hired engineers from his previous startup, from Fuse. But also, he contracted Portal Player to create the software, and Pixo to design the user interface. Basically, just contract everything all the way down. Steve was still, all over it, of course, of course. Demanding better display tech, supposedly throwing a prototype into a fish tank so the escaping air bubbles would show just how much tighter they needed to pack everything in and insisting that the software and interface do as much as possible with as few clicks as possible. He was Steve. And Johnny Ivan team absolutely still took care of the industrial design with a Braun T3 transistor radio inspired look, but with double shop plastic, but too polished stainless steel that was laser etched. All controlled by this click wheel suggested by Apple's head of marketing, Phil Schiller, reminiscent of a Bang & Olufsen BCom 6000 telephone. A design that was so distinctive that it didn't require a, a logo and a name on the front. But Apple didn't even come up with the name iPod. That was from another contractor, Vinny Chaco, who got it from 2001's famous line, Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Which was just so perfect because it launched that same exact year, October 23rd, 2001. We are introducing a product today that takes us exactly there, and that product is called iPod. Still in the shock and shadow of 9-11, which is a whole other story, but because Apple had been willing to think outside the box, not just outside the Mac and computer box, but outside their own existing orgs, they were able to push out the iPod and that year, but only for the Mac, which I mean, totally wasn't a problem for Steve because he just assumed anyone who wanted an iPod and didn't already have a Mac would just rush out and buy one. But Phil knew, he knew they were leaving an incredible amount of market and money on the table so he pushed for a Windows version. Three generations later, it had to work with the Windows de devices or Windows computers. 
because we weren't selling. But it always came back to Steve and Steve said, no, hell no. Over his dead body, no. He didn't want people to stop buying Macs to use the iPod, but his top people, his very best people, they didn't want to stop selling iPods just because they ran out of people with Macs to sell them to. And if they gave Windows users a taste of the Apple experience, hey, maybe some of them would even make the switch. In the end, it took the intervention of legendary personal tech reviewer, Walt Mossberg. He makes a music player. Do you guys know that? The iPod. To help convince Steve to even give it a shot. Today, we are introducing iPods for Windows. And it's that quality, not just being a futurist or product nosticator, or frankly, an ass who barked orders, but being someone who hired smart people, argued with them, went full on diva with them at times, but who ultimately trusted them to make the right call. It is the only reason why Apple is the company it is today. That's the part. That's the part that so many Latter-day Steve Jobs keep missing. And sure, if you got it wrong, you were a bozo or just plain gone. But if you got it right, Steve could be, would be convinced, even to the extent of believing it was his opinion all along. We've got cards and letters from lots of people that say that iTunes is the, their favorite app on Windows. Uh -huh. Like giving a glass of ice water to somebody in hell. But even then, even with the whole entire market suddenly open to the iPod, there was still one piece missing, one piece in Apple's music puzzle, the music. You know, Napster and Kazaa hit the music industry like a tsunami. Napster lets anybody, anywhere, download any song instantly. Nobody else works for free. Why should musicians? And everybody's at war with everybody else. And we looked at this and we thought, gosh, there's got to be a middle path out of this. Now, the music labels, they'd been looking at streaming, but Steve didn't like that idea. And we think people want to buy their music on the internet by buying downloads, just like they bought LPs, just like they bought cassettes, just like they bought CDs. And yeah, things were different back then, and Apple would eventually pay for that, but different story, and I want to get into that in a different video. But Steve was able to go to them and offer a legal licensed alternative. Today, we've got 200,000 tracks. When you click on Music Store, Boom, you go right in to the iTunes music store. Super easy to use, super easy to sync over to the iPod and just a dollar a song, a price and a user experience that was so good for the vast majority of people. It's not stealing anymore, it's good karma. But that wasn't the third decision, the one that would go on to change literally everything. We couldn't be happier with the critical success that we've gotten from the Nano. But what about the white iPod? It's been a huge success for us. And therefore, it's time to replace it. It made the music player market effectively into an iPod market. But by 2005, Steve and Apple could already see, they could already feel this existential threat on the horizon. There was a thought that phones might uh, might cannibalize sales of, of iPods. We just see the, the curve of cell phones going like this. You're going to have to have a phone in your pocket. So that's going to have to be the device that carries this information. So Apple began working on that, not the Moto Rocker. This is a phone that we have worked on with Motorola that has an iTunes client in it where you can play iTunes music that you've gotten from your CD library or bought from the online store. I mean, yes, the Moto Rocker, but no, never really the rocker, but a project codenamed Purple that combined a widescreen iPod initiative with a multi-touch tablet experiment. And shrink it down to something big enough or small enough to fit in your pocket. And the overly literal iPod as a click wheel to dial phone. And here it is. <laughs> and all of that eventually led to the greatest of great keynote moments in January of 2007, when Steve put Sneaker to stage and introduced an iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. The same exact moment the iPod died, even though the iPod Touch wasn't even introduced until the following September, even though iPod sales weren't even gonna peak until the following year. It was still the beginning of the end, 
dead gadget walking. And it was just a matter of time for the iPod to start losing its cachet. It's the best iPod we've ever made. Losing its prime just in time for the holidays September keynote slot. It's slice of the Apple revenue percentage pie. Even its product line. It is the end of the road for the classic design. Apple discontinues the iPod Nano and iPod Shuffle. Playlists, downloads, MP3s. All of it going the way of cassette tapes. Apple is discontinuing the iPod Touch, which is the last iPod. And that's the thing that a lot of other CEOs and companies keep getting wrong. Steve never forced Apple to stop or hold back just to protect the iPod. He wasn't determined to prevent any new ideas, any new products from hurting or cannibalizing that existing cash cow like Microsoft did with Windows just over and over and over again, which I mean is understandable if not excusable because it's just so incredibly tempting to do when profits are at their highest, often right before the crash. And some CEOs are super happy to ride them straight into the ground because they got a golden parachute anyway. And that's the difference, that's the key. Not just focus and commitment, but Steve didn't mistake his products for his business. He didn't mistake the iPod for Apple. He was making increasingly personal electronics and the iPod, even the Mac, were just instances of that. He wasn't gonna protect or artificially prop up any of them, not at the expense of the company. He knew that if anyone was gonna cannibalize the iPod, it damn well had better be Apple with something even better. Even if that something reduced their then most valuable popular product to a feature, reduced it from a device to a button. Even if the iPod had to die for that something, that's something that would end up becoming just way more valuable and way more popular. If that's something, if the iPhone was gonna live and it was those three very specific decisions, the willingness to go beyond Apple's existing products even if it meant going beyond the company to do it. The ability to trust the people you hire to grow those products and the business, even when you may disagree with them. And the understanding that no single product is your business, even when it's funding your business, because another product could come along that's even better for your business. That's what led to the iPod's massive, massive success and its destruction in the wake of the even more massively successful iPhone. Now, I need to tell you about the best daily newsletter you're ever gonna love to read. The one that made starting my days so much better than doom scrolling on Twitter and made me just so much smarter. And that's today's sponsor, Morning Brew, which gives me everything I really need to know each day, every day, in just five minutes and for absolutely free. It arrives perfectly timed, ready to read right when I wake up and it's impeccably curated with only the most important news and views in this snappy, informative, relevant, sometimes irreverent style. And yeah, 100% completely free, seven days a week, Monday through Sunday. Just click the link in the description and get your daily stocks and crypto highlights and stories like today, where I learned why all the billionaires might need to start flying commercial and what it looks like at the very center of the galaxy. It's morning brew, it's free. It takes all of 15 seconds to subscribe and it starts your day off smart. So just hit the button on the screen or click the link in the description and you'll not only get a free newsletter you'll actually read, but one you'll consistently enjoy. Clicking on that link really helps out the channel and so does hitting up this video to learn all about the fights and the copying and the fights over copying between Apple and Google and what it really means for all of us. Just hit up that video and I'll see you there.